Hello, thank you for joining me. And today I want to change gears a little bit from what I was doing in the last couple videos. What I want to talk about today is what Plato means by art. Also, by the end of this video, I also want to talk about why he refers to philosophy as the highest or the most exalted of all of the arts. Okay, so what does he mean by art? Well, often when we think of Plato in art, we think about how to apply mathematics to art, such as the circle of fifths being applied to music or the golden ratio being applied to architecture, for example. I'm going to go in a little different direction. And what we'll see if you look at the use of art in his dialogues is that sometimes it is used loosely. And like in the dialogue Eon, he doesn't really even define it at all, even though he keeps bringing it up. Or um, sometimes he refers to even money making as an art, and that doesn't actually fit his precise definition of art. So what I want to do in this video is pull together places where he was being more precise and see if we can get a clearer idea of what he means by art. Okay, so I want to start with his Republic. Now I'm going to be pulling out a rather lengthy passage, but please be patient with it because it is going somewhere and there is something very important about art here. Because I'm taking this out of context, I'm going to set it up for you. So he's talking, Socrates is talking to a man named Thrasymachus about justice. There's actually a group of them, but Thrasymachus jumps in and he's a bit of a cynical Machiavellian type. And he says that, you know, there's a lot of virtue signaling about what people think virtue, what justice is. But the truth is, is whoever has power is the one who decides what is right. Might makes right, basically. And he insists that this is true, that the stronger the advantage of the stronger is what it means to be just. If the person in power says this is the way things are, then hey, that's the way things are. And that person will always look out for his or her own advantage. So that's his position. And that's what launches this whole discussion. And it's a, a rather lengthy one. I do have a video on that for those of you interested in seeing how the Republic is set up because it is all about justice. But um, in the course of this discussion, about whether or not it's true that justice is nothing more than the advantage of the stronger, Socrates is going to bring in the idea of art. And he uses a lot of his usual sort of examples, like the physician or the captain of a ship. And then from that, he's going to go into making a point, the point that I'm going to be showing you. So that's where we're picking this up. And so Socrates says to Thrasymachus, Tell me, your physician in the precise sense of whom you were just now speaking, is he a moneymaker, an earner of fees, or a healer of the sick? And remember to speak of the physician who is really such. And he says, a healer of the sick. So in other words, uh, a person may make a living working as a physician, but the role of physician, by definition, is a healer of the sick, not a moneymaker. Okay, and what of the pilot, or the captain of a ship? The pilot, rightly so-called, is he a ruler of sailors or a sailor? A ruler of sailors. We don't, I fancy, have to take into account the fact that he actually sails in the ship, nor is he to be denominated a sailor. For it is not in respect of his sailing that he is called a pilot, but in respect of his art and his ruling of the sailors. True. Then for each of them, is there not a something that is for his advantage? Quite so. And is it not also true that the art naturally exists for this, to discover and provide for each his advantage? Yes, for this. Is there then for each of the arts any other advantage than to be as perfect as possible? What do you mean by that question? Just as if you should ask me whether it is enough for the body to be the body, or whether it stands in need of something else, I would reply, by all means it stands in need. That is the reason why the art of medicine has now been invented, because the body is defective, and such defect is unsatisfactory. To provide for this, then, what is advantageous, that is the end for which the art was devised. Do you think it would be a correct answer or not? And Thrasymachus says that it's correct. Okay, now Socrates has a long point to make. Um, how about this? 
Is the medical art itself defective or faulty, or is any other art any need of some virtue, quality, or excellence? And for this reason, is there need of some art over them that will consider and provide what is advantageous for these very ends? Does there exist in the art itself some defect, and does each art require another art to consider its advantage? And is there need of still another for the considering art, and so on ad infinitum? Or will the art look out for its own advantage? Or another possibility, is it a fact that it needs neither itself nor another art to consider its advantage and provide against its deficiency? For there is no defect or error at all that dwells in any art, nor does it befit an art to seek the advantage of anything else than that of its object. But the art itself is free from all harm and admixture of evil, and is right so long as each art is precisely and entirely that which it is. And consider the matter in this precise way of speaking. That's referring to something Thrasymachus had said earlier. Is it so or not? It appears to be so, he says. Okay, now a few more steps here. Then medicine does not consider the advantage of medicine. It considers the advantage of the body. Yes. Nor does horsemanship consider the advantage of horsemanship, but rather it considers the advantage of horses. Nor does any other art look out for itself, for it has no need, but for that of which it is the art. So it seems, Thrasymachus replies. And then here's the last step. But surely, Thrasymachus, the arts do hold rule, and they are stronger than that of which they are the arts. And Socrates tells us that he conceded this, but it went very hard. Then no art considers or enjoins the advantage of the stronger. So here he's dismissing Thrasymachus' argument. But every art considers that of the weaker, which is ruled by it. And this too he was finally brought to admit though he tried to contest it. Okay, so we've got some information here, but we've also got some questions. Um, it's not quite clear at this point why Socrates is saying that the art is perfect in and of itself and it has no defects. Because even in his art, his example, excuse me, of medicine as an art, well, we can think of um, shortfalls yet in our understanding of medicine. Um, we still don't have a cure for cancer, for example. And there are times when doctors disagree with one another. And so how can you say there is no defect? What does he mean by that? So we have to hold on to that question. But what we can take from this is that the arts have some sort of rulership and that they always are for the benefit of their object. The doctor is not, doing, is not engaging in the art of medicine for his or her own sake, but for the benefit of the patient, of whoever's the object. And so that is a very key point to understanding the arts. And then we're also going to see throughout Plato's dialogues that the art that he considers the greatest is philosophy. And here's one example. This is also in the Republic. He says that in comparison with the other arts, the prestige of philosophy even in her present lowest state, because it has very low, um, bad reputation in his day, and I think even today as well, um, but even in its present lowest state, it retains a superior dignity. So we want to better understand why the arts are considered to be without defect in and of themselves, and um, why serving their, or for the benefit of their object, why is philosophy the greatest of the arts? Well, to look at that question first of why the arts are considered to have no defects in and of themselves, I think it would be helpful to take a look at the statesman. Um, there are still some translations floating around with the title Politicus, so I included that in parentheses here, but I think most translations today call it statesman. And I'm going to show you just one slide from this dialogue, and this is in a discussion about due measure. So what they're talking about here is that there's more than one way to measure things. Sometimes we measure things 
relative to one another, but uh, the only way to truly know something is the true measure of it. So for example, using the example of the doctor that we've been using, um, you can say that somebody is a better doctor than that guy over there, but if that guy over there is a terrible doctor, then it's not necessarily saying much to say that you're better. So that's not necessarily a good measure of goodness. The only true measure is against goodness itself. And so looking to the good is the, the true measure, and what he's calling here due measure. Okay, with that in mind, here's a statement about art. So first I'm just going to read through it, and then we can go back through it and understand it better. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is really scratchy today, sorry. Mm. Let's see if we can get through this. All right, so two propositions stand or fall together. The first is that the arts exist. And the second is that excess and deficiency are measurable not only relatively, but in terms of the realization of a norm or due measure. Thus, if measure in the second sense exists, then so do the arts. And conversely, if there are arts, then there is the second kind of measurement. To deny either is to deny both. Okay, let's take a look at the two propositions. So the first one <clears throat> is that the arts exist. Now I put the Greek ani in parentheses here because in the Greek language there is more than one way to, they have more than one word for our verb to be. And to exist in our physical world in a temporal sense is a different word than to exist as an absolute reality, to have a true existence. And the word ani is that more elevated word for exist. And so what he's saying here is not just that the, there, there are arts, that somebody invented the art of medicine or that somebody invented the art of horse, horsemanship or whatever. He's not just saying that these arts are functioning because somebody created them. He's saying that they truly exist. And so that's the first proposition. And that already tells us why he says that they are perfect in and of themselves. And the second proposition is that this idea of due measure is a true measure. That there's not just the relativity of A compared to B, but there is a true measure. And so these two propositions would have to stand or fall together. That if, there, if the arts exist, there must be a true measure by which these arts um, can look to... to for their cause, what are they measured against to be absolutely true? And if there is this absolute tr truth, then there would be the arts and the, all the things that truly exist. And so these two exist together. And this also tells us why the art in itself is perfect and without any defect. So sometimes we don't execute the art perfectly, but the art itself that we're looking to in our efforts to execute it as perfectly as we can, that art truly exists and it's without defect. Okay, so that's the point we wanna see here. And now to see this even more and to add to it a little bit more, we're gonna to go to the Philebus. So the Philebus is a dialogue where Socrates is taking on the question of what is the happiest, best life? The life in pursuit of knowledge or the life in pursuit of pleasure? And in the course of this discussion, there's a great deal of metaphysics, which I'm not going to even touch on in this video, but I do have videos on the Philebus for those of you interested in that. And I'm going to jump to the conclusion. I think even those of us who have not read it will be able to guess which life Socrates um, would favor. And so I don't think I'm, I'm uh, giving you a spoiler here. But here's his breakdown of the best lives. And the first, he gives a ranking here. Um, the first is somewhere in the region of measure, and the second lies in the region of what is proportioned and beautiful. He puts re reason, excuse me, reason and intelligence third, and fourth, he says, belongs to the soul itself, and he puts in the soul sciences and arts. Now, I didn't bother writing the fifth, excuse me, the fifth and sixth because it's beyond the scope of this video, but the fifth is the pleasures that are in line with nature, and the sixth, the lowest, are the what he calls irrational pleasures. But what I really want to focus on is the fourth, because this tells us that he is putting the arts in the soul. So even if the art 
is one that um, services or is for the advantage of the body, still the art itself is in the soul. So the person looks to the art in their soul and they have the art in their soul and they're looking to the intelligible realm, to the absolute reality of what tru the art that truly exists to get their direction and, and they want to execute that art as best they can in the, in the physical world. And so whether the object is the soul or the body or an animal or whatever, um, the art itself is in the soul and we're looking to the intelligible realm to best understand that art. Now we can see here, by the way, that these rankings that he's giving here in the Philebus match to our metaphysical realms. So um, with the um, material realm at the bottom, that would match to the irrational pleasures. The pleasures that are in line with nature would match up to the realm of nature. And then above that is the realm of soul, and that's what we're seeing here is fourth, the sciences and the arts. Above that is noose, and that's reason and intelligence. Above that is the intelligible, which is often called the beautiful, or and it's often called proportion. And then above that is the first cause of all, which is where we find due measure. So what he's saying here is very much consistent with the metaphysics we've been seeing throughout, and also what we just saw in the statesman. Okay, now we can take everything he just said there, everything we've seen so far, and see how it applies to the Gorgias. What does this add to it? So here, Socrates is talking to a sophist named Gorgias, who is famous for rhetoric. And there are places where Socrates might talk about the art of rhetoric, and many people talk of rhetoric as an art. But here, Socrates is being more precise, and he's saying, you know what? Rhetoric is not really an art at all. And let's see why he says that. Here's what he says about rhetoric. He says that he calls it a form of flattery. And he goes on to say, I claim that this kind of thing is bad because it aims at what is pleasant. And we just saw that pleasant or seeking pleasure is at those lower realms. And it aims at what is pleasant, ignoring the good, which is the true good, the true measure, due measure. And I insist that it is not an art, but a routine, because it can produce no principle in virtue of which it offers what it does, nor explain the nature thereof. And consequently, it is unable to point to the cause of each thing it offers. And I refuse the name of art to anything irrational. So if art is in the soul, and the soul is intellectual in nature, then nothing that is in the soul is going to be irrational or nothing in the higher realms of the soul I should say we do have an irrational part of soul but in that higher realm of soul um, there's nothing irrational there the arts would not be irrational he's not going to call anything by the name of art that is irrational now to better understand this distinction between what truly benefits its object versus what gives an image of benefit let me go back just a little bit to show you some of the conversation that led up to that. So here's an exchange between Socrates and Gorgias. So you admit the existence of bodies and souls, of course, and do you consider that there is a healthy condition for each? I do. And a condition of apparent but not real health. For example, many people appear healthy of body and no one could perceive they are not so except a doctor or some physical trainer. That is true. And so here's Socrates' conclusion. There exists, I maintain, both in body and in soul, a condition which creates an impression of good health in each case, although it is false. So there are some routines, as he calls them here, that give the appearance of physical health, for example, or give the appearance of health of the soul. And he uses rhetoric as one example of that. It is, um, it can give the impression of being wise, which would be a manifestation of a healthy soul. They can give the appearance of being wise. You can talk in a way that sounds wise, that may fool some people, but it is not a true state of health. And so the arts have to truly benefit either the body or the soul. And then 
one final step we want to go is to see why philosophy is considered the most exalted of all of the arts, of all the benefits, because there are many arts that benefit the soul. We can see why Socrates would think that an art that benefits the soul would be above an art that benefits the body. But there are many arts that benefit the soul. Music and the things that we generally think of as the arts, as the fine arts, they all benefit the soul in some way. But he says none of them benefit the soul quite the way philosophy does. And for that, we're going to end with the Phaedrus. Now, here's where um, Plato is giving us that beautiful image of the soul being compared to a chariot being pulled by two horses. Now, if those horses or if one of them is unruly, that chariot is going to get a very small glimpse of the divine. And it's going to, and it's not going to have much of a memory in this life. But if the horses are well behaved, then that soul is going to be able to get a good look at the divine and will be have more of a memory of that. And Another point that's important to point out here before I go to the quotes from this dialogue is that the gods do not have horses pulling their chariots because their chariots have wings. And so only divine souls can have wings. But us as humans, we can grow wings, but we have to work for it. And that's the education of the soul. Okay, with that in mind, here's a quote from that dialogue. So Socrates says that in, indeed it is necessary to understand about humans denominated according to species that we are a being proceeding from the information of many senses to a perception contracted into one by the reasoning power. Very much consistent with what we saw last week in, um, in the video about Plotinus, um, Ennead 6.9, where he talked about bringing together the soul into a unity. So often you can reach a certain state of health by, bring, by simply um, clearing away a lot of false beliefs and having a clear sense, like having a self-image that is fairly unified, that is generally considered healthy. That's the relative sense of healthy, but it is relatively healthy compared to most people in the world. Um, and so that is a certain idea of health, and many of the arts can bring us to that. But only philosophy can bring us that further stage of truly contracting the soul into one to the point where you can have divine experiences or peak experiences. And that's really the goal of philosophy. And he goes on to say that if you can bring that level of unity to your soul, this is a recollection of what our soul formerly saw with divinity when in a perfect condition of being, and when she despised what we now consider reality. So what we now consider, it's like David Hume saying he can kick a rock and that proves that it's real. Well, the soul in this more exalted state despises that notion of what reality is. And the soul was supernally elevated to the contemplation of that which is true. On this account, the dianoetic power alone of the philosopher is justly winged. For the philosophic memory perpetually adheres as much as possible to these concerns by an application to which even a god becomes divine. So philosophy is the art that can allow us to grow our wings, so to speak. So when we're reading Plato or, Plat excuse me, Plato or Plotinus, let me get, I get a drink here, hold on. Okay, when we're, sorry about that, when we're reading Plato, or Plotinus, or working with a living teacher, the art that that person is able to exercise is, is what benefits us. And then if we grow to the point where we are able to guide someone else, then we're able to benefit that person. It's always the object. So we as soul, art is in the soul. We look to the absolute art, the one that truly exists. We try to execute that in the world, and to the degree we're able to, we're able to benefit the recipient or the object. And philosophy is the art, the only art, that not only benefits the soul, but it benefits it in a way that is most meaningful to our existence. And so, on that profound note, I'm going to ask you to hit the like button. How twisted is that? But it does help the video um, 
rise up and so other people can see it. Um, and so if you have any questions or comments or requests for future videos, please leave those below. And I thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you'll join me next week. Thank you very much.